Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Director of Clinical Research, Dr. Nicole Stevens. I love that so many of you are here on a Saturday morning. Thank you. We are excited to have you with us. Did you realize just a few generations ago, we thought our ideas about DNA were pretty cut and dried. Actually, we didn't even know about DNA a few generations ago. But then we just realized, well, if the genes encode it, that's how it is. Good luck with that. The roll of the dice, such as it were. But you know, we have evolved in the way that we think about our genes, about our DNA. Our ancestors instinctively knew that if they did healthy things like get enough sleep, eat a good diet, they would have a better life. Those adages, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? Early to bed, early to rise. We've known these things for a while, but how? Isn't our health hard-coded into our DNA? Well, maybe not. We are starting to realize through the science of something called epigenetics that it's a lot more flexible than we originally thought. Epi, meaning above or on top of, and genetics, referring to our genes. The things we do each day shape who we are. Right? It's powerful and maybe a little bit scary to realize what we eat, drink, how we sleep, how we exercise, the things we put in and on and around our bodies are making us who we are maybe even more than the genes we were born with. It becomes nature and nurture, but we control the nurture part. So how might one think about epigenetics? And maybe of more interest to us, where do essential oils come in? So I'd like to propose for you a simple analogy to think about epigenetics, and then we'll bring our essential oils into the mix. Now this analogy is not gonna encompass everything about epigenetics, it's not a perfect paradigm, but maybe it will help you be able to talk to people about it and understand it and think about it. And some of you may have heard this one before, so bear with me, because we want to kind of build a foundation, make sure we're all on the same page. But let's give you some background and then talk about our oils. Let's think about DNA like a box of recipes. You inherited this amazing recipe box from your mom who got it from her mom, and so on and so on. And this recipe box has everything, everything you could ever want. Appetizers, soups, bread, salads, everything. And maybe some things you don't want, but they're in the box anyway. Now this is like your DNA. Your genes code for everything about you, every possibility that could be you. Some of these things don't change throughout your lives, and we're glad about that, like the number of ears that you're going to make, usually. Come on. <laughs> Does anyone have three ears? No, no offense, if that's the case, no judgment. But some of these things can change based on what we do, and in fact, they do change based on our daily activity. Now, say you've got a recipe that you love. You make it all the time. Everyone raves about it. It's your signature dish. What do you do with that recipe? You're going to mark it. You want to be able to find it fast. This is the same thing that happens with our DNA. We mark it. Little marks called methyl groups or methyl tags get put onto our DNA in specific places. And depending on where they're put, this either tells our genes to switch off or switch on. Now, when that happens, it changes the expression of that gene, which changes the proteins that are coded, and it changes something about ourselves. So in our recipe box, one kind of tag might tell us, ooh, this is a good recipe, make it lots. Another kind of tag might say, whoa, this one's bad news, stay away from it. But those tags help us now navigate which recipes we want to use. So tagging is the first step, tagging the DNA itself. But there's a lot more levels to it than that. Within our cells, the DNA is wound around these little protein spools called histones. Think of like a spool of thread with the DNA wound and wound and wound around it. We actually can tag these histone spools as well. 
They're the ones that are going to tell our DNA, stay spooled up really tight. Don't access this. This is bad news. Or it will open up like we string the thread out and will allow the DNA to be used and copied. And that's how we can make our genes express. So these marks on the little histone spools are very dynamic, very important. They change. They can change every single day based on what we do. So like my recipe box, I am going to organize it. I'm going to put some of the recipes up front where I can access them quickly and easily. They're the ones I use a lot. Some of them I'm going to just bunch up and back. I never access those. I'm going to put my little dividers in so I've got everything all organized and ready. This is like my genes. Okay? The way that we're marking and organizing and tagging allow us to now access the genes that we want. Now, we still have to be able to make those recipes. For all the stuff we're doing to our DNA, we have to be able to actually get in there and make the proteins that make us. So this is our cellular machinery. And this is the little picture that you see up here. This is kind of a representation of all the different pieces and parts that go into making our proteins. It's a very complicated process. So think about it like this. I've got my recipe box. I've got it all organized and tagged and divided and nice. But I still got to go in the kitchen and make my food, right? And it turns out, no matter how much I want to make that pasta recipe, I can't if I don't have the right tools. No matter how much I want to bake my pie, it's not going to work if my oven's not heating correctly. So think about the DNA, the organization of that DNA, the tools we're using to copy and to make those proteins. All of this makes up the idea of epigenetics. Think of all of those levels of organization and change that are affected by what we do. Now, it's really these ideas that go into making us and our daily experience. It goes into this idea of what we call resilience. Life throws a lot at us, doesn't it? Isn't it amazing that our bodies can adapt to what's going on around us? We not only enhance our own health through what we do and how our DNA responds, we actually can pass these on as a legacy. Think about that. Some of the epigenetic changes we make are heritable for our children and for their children. So for good or bad, what we're doing to our recipe box, these changes then become what we pass on and it becomes our children's recipe boxes. Now, with all that background in epigenetics, where do essential oils come in? That's where the real interest starts, I think. You know, years ago I listened to a lecture in which the professor postulated that our ancestors were exposed to dozens, maybe hundreds of different plant chemicals every single day. They had plants brushing against their skin. They were breathing natural plant chemicals in the air. They were having lots of plants in their diet. You can imagine the epigenetic signals that this sent to their DNA. Good ones for the most part, very good ones. Any guesses how many natural plant chemicals the typical American is exposed to today? Any guesses? The professor of this lecture postulated fewer than 10. Think about it. With our indoor sedentary lifestyles and our sterile conditioned air and our overprocessed genetically modified artificial diets. Many of us have come a long way from our ancestral lifestyle in a very short time. On the other hand, we may be exposed to more than 3,000 synthetic chemicals every day. Present company excluded, I would think. Now, any guesses what all this does to our epigenetics? It's not very good, I'll be honest with you. If only there were a source of natural, complex plant chemicals that we could use, if only. We've got an oil for that. <laughs> Love it. 
enter essential oils. As we use these natural plant chemicals to replace the synthetic things in our lives, we are signaling our bodies through mechanisms that cannot be accessed any other way. Think about that for a second. Olfactory receptors exist on cells throughout our bodies, not just our noses, organs, skin, bones. Why are they there if not to receive signals from our environment, from our essential oils, I dare say? The endocannabinoid system is another example of a ready-made process for essential oils to send signals to our bodies. Immune systems, digestive systems, all of these things are primed to receive environmental signals. So what kind of signals will we send? Is, as we use essential oils every day, I believe we are recapturing some of that important evolutionary signal that our industrialized society has forgotten. I think of it almost like bringing that ancestral forest back into our homes through essential oils and filling in some of the gaps in our health we maybe didn't even know we had. So essential oils contain dozens, sometimes hundreds of natural plant chemicals sounds a little bit closer to that ancestral lifestyle, wouldn't you think? Now, one important thing to keep in mind, I got to follow after Laura Jacobs, who is absolutely amazing. Did you enjoy what she had to say? I'm glad that I got to follow after her and Dr. Riggs because we tie together in a very important way. Okay, she talked about purity, adulteration, so did Dr. Riggs. Do you think, particularly in the context of epigenetics, that purity matters? Yes. You think our bodies and genes can tell the difference between an authentic essential oil and a synthetic one? Yes. You bet they can. How could they not? This is critical to understand. We grew up with plants. We evolved with plants. Our bodies are made to recognize these signals, to adapt with them, to change with them. The difference between natural and synthetic is a physiological benefit. I will echo the message that Lara just said. It is physiological, not just a nice smell, right? I bet you, you have experienced this daily for yourselves as well. So we have evidence that the natural chemistry of essential oils can interact with cells and signal positive epigenetic changes. We see this in protein pathways. We see it in healthy body processes like supported sleep, immunity, mood lifting, enhanced vitality, lower morbidity, overall higher quality of life. Okay, we don't have the specifics on this yet. You know why? Because epigenetics is so, so new. We're talking within like my lifetime and less. Probably within the few decades I've been studying essential oils, this has come into existence. So we are so excited to do some of this research and to be able to talk to you. We have some projects going on right now that we will get to share with you. But in the meantime, you see the epigenetic changes that are going on. So let me leave you with a couple of final ideas. Epigenetics can change our, D our DNA expression without changing the DNA itself. It's just an easy way to think about epigenetics and maybe use the recipe box analogy if you're talking to someone else about it. Epigenetics are influenced by lifestyle. It's important for us to remember that this, whatever lifestyle we choose to use, is the kind of life we will have and the kind of person we will be. So that is a very profound thing when you think about it. You may have the genes for diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, but just because you have that recipe, do you have to make it? I may have the recipe for blood pudding, that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and make it. And unless blood pudding is your thing, in which case, no judgment. But that is a very profound thing to realize. This prevention model is powerful. Finally, tantalizing evidence exists that essential oils may offer powerful epigenetic control and support for our cells, for our bodies, and we have now seen and are beginning to understand why the essential oils work the way they do. It's on a genetic level. 
clear down the DNA in our cells. So I'd love to leave you with a quote from a modern philosopher, uh, Michael Cortell, who said, in every human being, genomes tell the story of our evolution, written in the language of DNA. The narrative is unmistakable and ever-changing. So I ask you, what will your narrative be? How will you write your epigenome and evolve your recipe box for your, your children and generations to come? I invite you to keep feeding your passion. I know I'm speaking to the choir when it comes to wanting a healthier, more natural lifestyle, and I applaud you for that. You are making a positive difference for yourselves, for your families, for your children, for your neighbors, for everyone around you. And I would say, if this talk of epigenetics sounding a little Star Trek, I will just add my thought to that, that doTERRA really is boldly going where no one has gone before. So stay with us, we've got lots to come. <laughs>